Oh, it's a very broad subject, but I'll try as much as I can as led by the Spirit and by the knowledge of the Word to, to, to bring some light and understanding to you. And so I'll be speaking on the subject, Fulfilling Your Destiny. Fulfilling Your Destiny. Psalm 33, verse 13 to 15. Psalm number 33, reading from the 13th verse to the 15th verse. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. I want you to take note of that. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their heart individually. He considered all their works. Let me take it again. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the hearts, all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their heart individually. He considers all their ways. Shall we pray? Father, we bless you tonight for again the opportunity to be in your presence and to celebrate you. As we celebrate you tonight, we ask the Lord you feed us with your word. May the entrance of your word bring us light and understanding. Tonight, none of me and all of you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their heart individually. He considers all their works. Fulfilling your destiny. I don't know if you, have, if, if you have ever felt the need to ask yourself if you are really fulfilling your destiny in life. And I believe that at every point in our lives, we ask ourselves certain questions. What am I here for? What am I doing? What can I do? Am I fulfilling my destiny? What are my gifts? What are my talents? Why life? Am I supposed to be doing something special? Or am I just supposed to be doing what I'm doing? These are many questions that come to us from time to time. And sometimes you don't even seem to fit in life. And sometimes you have a lot of rejection and frustration that comes your way that makes you wonder if you actually belong here. Amen. And sometimes even when you have a gift and you are operating with a gift, sometimes people find it very difficult even to accept you and your gift. And so it, it makes us wonder sometimes if we are actually on the right track and we are doing the right thing. And sometimes when you look around in this world, we have presidents, we have prime ministers, we have doctors, we have millionaires, we have preachers, musicians, actors, and many great men and women. And sometimes when you compare yourself to any of these people, you want to ask yourself, am I really fulfilling life? Because if I compare my life to all of these, my life seems to be nothing near where they are. And so it leaves us with a lot of unanswered questions. But the psalmist says that the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considered all their works. This, picture, this scripture gives us a picture of an overseer Somebody who is superintending over our lives. And Bible says that he sees all of us. And he's able to identify every one of us. Bible says that from the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. I love the verse 15. He says, he fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. He fashions their hearts individually and he considers all their works. 
He fashions their heart. Somebody say, he fashioned my heart. And say, he considers my work. There are three things here I want us to look at. Number one. God sees each of us as individuals. God sees each one of us as individuals. He knows each of us by our names and even the number of hair on our head. The Bible says the number of hair on our head has been numbered by God. And so if number 13 pulls out, God knows that this number specifically is out. Because he has numbered them. Amen. Amen. So he knows each of us individually. When God looks down, he doesn't just see people. He doesn't just see KPM. He doesn't just see Ghanaians. He doesn't just see Nigerians. But he sees individuals. Can I have an amen? amen? And so God does not see us based on the group we belong. But he sees us as individuals. In the midst of all the thousands and the millions of people all over the world, when God looks down, he sees you and he sees me. It is easy to see ourselves based sometimes on the group we belong to. Oh, I, I'm a Christian and so you want to identify yourself with Christians. I'm a Nigerian and so you want to identify yourself with Nigerian. I'm a Ghanaian and so you want to identify yourself as a Ghanaian. But when God looks at you or he looks on the earth, he sees Pastor Prince, Prince Frimpong as an individual. He sees Samuel Opoku as an individual. Yes, even though we might belong to all kinds of ethnic groups, but God sees us individually. Amen. And so say he sees me as an individual. And so you don't go through life boasting as a result of where you come from, but you must boast on the fact of who you are as a unique person. You don't go through life boasting because you are Nigerian or boasting because you are a member of KPM. You must boast because of the uniqueness that God has made you. You are you. You are unique. You are an individual that God considers. Amen. Number two, God has, in, God has internally wired you uniquely. You are, you are different and you are unique. There is no one who is wired like you. All of us are wired differently. That's why sometimes what makes you happy makes somebody sad. That's why what, sometimes what makes you laugh, somebody is frowning. That's why sometimes what you can withstand, others cannot withstand because we are uniquely wired by God. Amen. Amen. He, constructed, he constructed us uniquely and, and differently in our spirit or in our being. And so what is in me, the way I am wired within, is definitely different from the way you are wired within. And that's why you are special. There's no one on this planet Earth with your inter internal wiring. We, that's why sometimes you can't easily be figured out. Because you are, you are unique. Number three. God judges what we do by what he has deposited in our hearts. God judges what we do by what he has deposited in our heart. Verse 15 says that he consider all their works. He will consider your works based on what he has deposited in your heart and not based on what others are doing. He considers their works. And so when God is looking at you, he wants to see you do what he has deposited in your heart and not do what somebody else is doing. He does not just consider what you are doing, but he considers it based on what he has deposited within you. And so it is possible that one who can be doing something that is not being deposited in him by God. And that's why sometimes we end up, in order to please society, we do things that sometimes we know within ourselves that we are not supposed to be doing. Because that is what the society says. And that's what the society expects. When you come to America, they will tell you that one of the best ways to break through is to be in the medical field. And so whether you have medical wiring within your system or not, you are forced to 
go into the field and some, some, sometimes some of you know that you don't belong there. But the expectation is that it, it can take care of you. And so you spend all your life studying biology and chemistry that you know is not internally wired within you. And that's why you struggle. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's the expectation of men. And so it is therefore possible to work effectively but all that you are doing is based on what is not fashioned in your heart. So in other words, you must do what is fashioned by God in your heart. You don't, if you want to fulfill your destiny, you must work according to what God has deposited in your heart. He will consider your works. He gives you what he will judge. Hallelujah. Are you with me? So if you want to fulfill your destiny on earth and to be able to determine where you fit in life, it is important to do what I call the heart check. Check your heart. Check your heart. Tell somebody, check your heart. So how do we check our heart? Number one, if I have to check my heart and know that what I'm doing is within my heart, what God has deposited in my heart, then number one, I have to check by, you know, knowing that I am enthusiastic about what I'm doing. So the first way to check your heart is enthusiasm. How enthusiastic are you in what you are doing? Do you have enthusiasm for what you are doing and do you have passion for it? Because enthusiasm has to do with what? Passion. That is what fires your passion. Are you passionate about what you are doing? Does what you're doing make you come alive? Or it kills something within you? You know, there are times you consider some people to be quiet. Oh, this person doesn't talk. But you'll be surprised that when you bring some subjects along the way, all of a sudden, a quiet person begins to talk very actively. Why are they talking? Because you brought up a subject that they are very enthusiastic about. Until you come along with that subject, you will never get them to talk. It does not necessarily mean that they are quiet, but they have not found something they are very interested in. And so bring that subject out and then you realize that they are so much into it. And so what I'm saying is that what is it that you are so interested in? If you want to know what is deposited in your heart, then you must check how excited you are or how enthusiastic you are about certain subjects. If you are enthusiastic about science, then you, might, you know where you are heading towards. If you are very enthusiastic about numbers, then you know where you are heading towards as an accountant. But if, if, if you're not, if, if mathematics does not appeal to you and somebody is trying to force you to become you know, an accountant, you are not interested in that line. Your interest is not there and so you find it difficult to work towards that particular subject. And so the question I want to ask you tonight, if you really want to fulfill your destiny and have a check of your heart and know that what I'm doing is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing, then you must, number one, find out if you are really excited or interested or enthusiastic about what you are doing. And so how, how does it excite you? How does it interest you? If it is interesting to you, it means that it's been wired in your heart. And that is why you get your boldness and your confidence from. Sometimes we look at some people and we think that, like I said, they do not have anything to offer to us, but bring them to the place of the enthusiasm. And you will see how much they will function for us. And so, what is it that interests you? What are you doing? Does it really interest you? You go to work, are you excited about your job? Are you so much into it or, or because you just want to pay bills? If you are talking about paying bills, then you must understand that you are only existing. If you really want to live to fulfill your destiny, it's not, destiny goes beyond payment of bills. But America has subjected us to this point where, oh, let me just take care of the bills and I'm okay. 
And I know for a fact, as I look at your faces, that there are many here who are doing things that they are not interested about. May God help us. Number two, excitement. How to check your heart. I beg your pardon, enjoyment. Do you, do you enjoy what you are doing? Do you find fulfillment in what you are doing? The things you enjoy doing are the things that satisfies you. If what you are doing does not bring enjoyment to you, I wonder how it will satisfy you. For one, me, for one, I love to preach. And so it excites me. When I, when I hear a preacher, I am quickly connected. And because I love to preach, when people are talking, I, I always want to pay attention to it. Are they making good points? Are they ministering to me? Is there anything I can take away from it? And so I am always excited and I always enjoy preachers. Last two weeks I was with my sons in LA and Pastor Amos was preaching. And I sat down and I was looking to him. And by the time he will finish his 45 minute sermon, I've made a series that will last me for two, uh, two months. Because I enjoy preaching. Do you get enjoyment from what you're doing? If what you're doing brings you enjoyment, it brings you fulfillment, if it satisfies you, then you will know that you are really fulfilling your destiny. But there are many of us, we are sitting down there, we are doing what we are doing, and sometimes we are angry doing them. You leave the place angry. Sometimes your, your supervisors and your bosses have done nothing to you. You will easily get angry with them because, number one, you are angry with yourself and you are angry with what you are doing. How can you fulfill your destiny when you are angry with the things that becomes a vehicle to your fulfillment? Number three, effectiveness. Where you are most effective and productive in. What are you doing in life? Are you so effective in it? Where do you get your greatest results from without extra effort? Sometimes many of us, for us to get one result, we have to push ourselves, we have to drag ourselves, and we have to do extra, extra, extra before sometimes we get a result. But let me see that church, hard work is good, but some result comes as a, as a result of effectiveness and not hard work. You can do something for a short time, very effective, and it will produce something for you. And so it's not necessarily working hard, but what? Being effective in what you are doing. And so when I hear people say, I work hard, you, sometimes you are working hard, but it's, it's still not productive. And so look around, after 10 years of hard work in that field, what do you have to show? I'm talking about fulfilling your destiny. I'm trying to lay the foundation right. After being here for 15 years and they told you that this is the area that can fetch you money and you went in there and you did it, what is it that you have to show? I hope you're enjoying what you're doing. <laughs> are you effective in what you're doing? Are you effectively working? And do you see results in what you're doing? I believe that the greatest frustration in life is to work hard and to have, and to have nothing to show for. It's really frustrating. Some of you have been in one place for 12 years, seven years, 10 years, and they always come and say, Pastor, I don't like the place. And yet they go. I don't like, I, I hate my job, and yet they take the paycheck. <laughs> I pray that you be effective in what you are doing. Amen. You see, if it is in line with what God has given you to do, you don't have to struggle. You take it easy, and yet you see fulfillment. Anything that takes extra energy to do, check it. The flow is not there. The flare is not there. I don't see the need for you to struggle to do what God has wired within you. If it's wired, it flows naturally. The little effort, and you are on. But if it's not wired, you can pray, you can fast, but trust me, it becomes a struggle. Number four. 
exasperation. So I've talked about enthusiasm, I've talked about enjoyment, I've talked about effectiveness, and the last point is exasperation. It is when something irritates you to, to annoyance or anger. So what are the things that exasperate you? What are the things that annoys you? When things are not done properly in your life, do they, do they annoy you? When things are not in a straight line, do they annoy you? Me, for one, I like to be ordered. I, I like to be systematic and very logical. And so if they are not, I get angry. I get mad. And so let me say that the things that annoy you is an indication of how God has wired you. Can I say that again? The things that annoys you in life are the indications of how God has wired you. And so most of the things that, and so most of the time, the things that annoys you are the problems you were wired to solve. Most of the time, the things that annoys you in life are the things, are the problems God has wired you to solve. And so it's not just an annoyance, but an annoyance that produces what? Results. And so you walk in here and you are upset about the setup. And because you want it done right, all of a sudden you begin to find ways and means to get this thing straightened up. And so there's an annoyance in your spirit that is producing results. And so if something annoys you constantly in life, it's a sign that there's a destiny connected somewhere. Can I have an amen? The reason I'm saying that is because most people will see the same thing and they don't get angry. Some people will get here and everything is beautiful. But some, some people who pay so much attention to details can walk in here and know that there's something wrong. And they begin to find answers. They're always agitated about something. God did not put that holy anger in you just for annoyance sake. But because there is what? A solution within you. And you must understand that in life you get promoted by the problems you solve. And not the problems you complain about. I thought you would say better amen. And so if there's something that is irritating you, God is saying that solve the problem. Talk about it. Don't just talk about it, but act. Solve it. And that means that you are on your right path to destiny. But many of us, we just talk about it because everybody is talking about it. If you don't have a solution for it, just be quiet. If the thing is annoying you, it's me, God is saying that do something about it. And the more you do something about it, the more greatness within you rises out of you. And you must understand that when you are so passionate about something, ladies and gentlemen, people will give you space to function. Let's see how passionate you are. No matter how much the obstacle might be, once you are passionate about it, you will always find a way. So when you hear people giving excuses, oh, I wasn't allowed, I wasn't given an opportunity, you are just complaining. If this is what God has deposited within you, there is always a way out. Can I have an amen? Let's read the book of Acts chapter number 7, verse 22 to 27. This is the summary of the life of Moses by Stephen. Acts chapter 27, verse 22 to 27. The Bible said, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in works and deeds. Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his children. I love this place. It came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffering wrong, suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren will have understood that God would deliver them by their hand. But they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. And he tried to reconcile them. Saying, men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? This is a very interesting piece of story. Moses was raised as an Egyptian, but he was a Jew. And the Bible said one day he killed somebody and everybody is wondering why he must do that. Because if you raise in the house of Pharaoh, you must know the law. Are you with me? And so you must know that this is right. 
And this is wrong. Bible said, when he got to that place, something came into his heart. Take note of that phrase. Something came into his heart. And so, whatever made Moses to kill the Egyptian was as a result of the something that came into his heart. He's not a murderer. He knows the law. He knows that killing is wrong. He lives in the corridors of power. But at that point, something came into his heart. What is that thing? Let me give you four points. Number one, his preparation. Somebody say preparation. Now hear me, this series is not going to be that exciting, but it's going to be very informative. And you, you will need to reason with me to understand what God is saying to you. His preparation. The Bible says that he was learned in all wisdom. He was trained in the art of leadership and knew how to conduct himself well in the corridors of power. Moses knew how authority works. Moses was introduced to power system and power structure. Why did God allow that? Because God knew that someday he was going to introduce him to power. And so for God to prepare him for the future, God had to allow him to have an experience in the code of power. And so God was saying that Moses, for the sake of the future, I am preparing you now. Can I have an amen? amen. And so he was raised in the house of Pharaoh so that some days, many years after, he will come back to face Pharaoh. Sometimes some of the places that you go through and some of the things that you go through in life are the very things that you must handle. And so today, you might think that it's not a pleasant thing, but God is giving you an experience so that someday when he brings you back, to that same place, as a result of the experience you've had in that place, you can, God can effectively use you to handle the place. And so your preparation in life is going to determine how far God can use you. And that is why God had to prepare David at the backside of the desert for the sake of the palace. And I believe that Bible said, and something came into his heart. That was Moses. I believe that on the same token, when David got to the battlefield and, 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 and what's the name? Goliath was making a lot of noise. I believe that something. When there was a preparation in your heart, something will always come into your heart. You don't hear me. You see, when you go to a place and there was chaos and you've been prepared for that place, when you get there, that thing in you will arise. The only reason why nothing will come into your heart is because there's no preparation in your heart. And that's why I said earlier on, what agitates you is a sign that the solution is in you. And so don't just walk in agitation and in exasperation. Walk in activeness. Be active and provide solution for those things. I don't know if I'm blessing somebody. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. He was prepared to face Pharaoh. So your preparation in life will determine what will come into your heart. Oh, people, sometimes it might not be the pleasant one, but it's still a preparation. It might not be very exciting, but it's still a preparation. Allow God to prepare you. And so his preparation, number two, God's prompting. God's prompting. Because he was prepared, Bible said, and it came into his heart. Hear me, church. The things that God wants you to do, they will not come outside of you, but into your own heart. The things that God wants you to do, they will not come outside of you. They will come to you. Somebody telling you must be a confirmation of what you have felt within you. Somebody telling you must be a confirmation of what God has already told you. How can God send someone to come and tell you something that he has not told you when it concerns your destiny? And so if somebody comes to give you a prophecy, cross-check, has God ministered it to you before? 
Because you are a child of God, you are his child, he's your father, and so he must learn how to deal with you. And sometimes to prove that he's with you, he sends another person to come with confirmation. Are you hearing me? And so there will always be God's prompting in your heart. He had the leading in his heart as Moses to do something as a leader. There are things people that will come to your heart sometimes that you have no explanation for. There are things that will come. I'm sure Moses will be like, why did I kill? And I know too well not to kill. <laughs> but something came into his heart. He was prompted. There was a prompting. Sometimes you, 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 you are prompted to find a solution to some problems. You, you go to bed and, and the Lord is leading you about something. You ask yourself, why me? I mean, how, how do I go about this? Have you been in a place where you think that what God is asking you to do is too big? It's too bigger than what you must do because considering every situation, you are not the one who should act. But when God prompts you, there is a way out. And so, don't take the promptings for granted. There are many of us here sitting here tonight, we have missed many great blessings and many great opportunities in life because we were not sensitive to the promptings of the spirit. Because we thought it was too big for us. He had a prompting in his spirit. There are things that will come into your heart, people, you have no explanation for them. Why do you start a church? I don't know. Why, why, how, how come you did that thing? Sometimes you don't even know. But you were led. Something came into your heart. God is in it. You may be prepared, but until the prompting comes, you cannot even understand yourself or your preparation. Have you been in a place where you said, now I know why I went through this. Now I understand. Now I perceive. Now it has come to the full knowledge why God allowed me to go through certain things. Sometimes when we are going through it at that moment, it doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Sometimes we want to even fight against it. And that's why many of us, we are praying prayers that God did not answer. Thank God that God did not answer some of your prayers. You won't say amen? Thank God for many unanswered what? Prayers. Elijah said, God, I want to die. Kill me. And yeah, when they brought the food, he ate. <laughs> what if God has answered, answered that prayer? You remember when you were so crazy about that man? I guess, my man, God, give it to me. God, give it to me. And God's looking at you 10 years' time when you see this man. <laughs> you won't like him. And 10 years after, when you met him, you're like, wow, is that the guy I was chasing after? <laughs> Thank God he did not answer that prayer. And so sometimes God takes us through some preparations and, and in the heat of those preparations as a result of the pain, the pressure, the humiliation, we pray God to take it away. But Paul said, there is a tone in my flesh. Satan is buffeting me. Three times I prayed that God would take it away. But because of the future, God said, I ain't taking it nowhere, but my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. Hallelujah. And so it is your prompting that makes your preparation sensible. It is the prompting. When God prompted something in your spirit, that's when you understand why you have to go through those preparations. And so I came to tell somebody, every one of the things you are going through, God has a hand in it. You might not like it. You might disagree with me. You want to pray against it. If God is in hand with God, why does? If you are a good God, God has a hand in it because you are too shallow, you are too immature. To handle the things that God has prepared for you. And so there must be a preparation period of time. And God's preparation doesn't come according to our terms. His preparation is, Bible says, as the heavens are far above the earth, so are his ways, including his preparation. Far above yours. It doesn't make sense, but the day the prompting will come, the day the opportunity will come, you will look back and say, thank God he allowed me to go through some of the things I went through. Amen. Are you not excited about this? Amen. Paul said, my brethren, I want you to understand that the thing that happened to me has helped for the furtherance of the gospel. It was supposed to kill me, but rather, it has rather promoted the gospel. Some preparation you are going through, even if the devil meant it for evil, God has a way to turn it around to make it good for you. 
And one day the devil will look at you and regret some of the things he brought you away because every one of the things, even though they might hurt, they might bring shame and disgrace, God has a way of turning them around so that at the fullness of time, they will become very beneficial to your destiny. That's why the devil, if the devil knew that attacking Job would, would give Job a better glory, a better future, he would have left him the way he was. And so when the prompting comes, preparation makes sense. Number three, his presumptions. Moses presumed that the Jews will accept him. Bible said that he supposed that the Jews will welcome him. But the people did not welcome him. His own people did not welcome him. Right? The fact that God told you doesn't mean that the people can easily understand you. The fact that God told you to do it, hear me church, doesn't mean that the people around are going to understand you. Sometimes even the people you are going to save are the people who will stand up against you. Meanwhile, God has prepared him God has brought the prompt into his spirit. But then, there was this aspect of it that Moses had no control about. The people and the acceptance. This aspect, hear me church, you cannot control how people should respond to you. And so if you are going to live your life based off on the way people respond to you, you will always drop your prompting, including your preparation, and walk away without fulfilling your destiny. Moses made a huge mistake by thinking that the people were going to accept him. Sometimes people are not ready to receive you. Even, when, even though you have the prompting, they are not ready to accept you. God told you, you are going to be great. But there are people who look at you and like, you don't belong here. Who are you? Hey, let me tell you something, church. Between now and your greatness, things will go wrong. You don't say amen, but it's okay. I said, between now and your greatness, things will go wrong. Don't presume that all will be well and everybody will be happy with you. Don't presume that. Don't presume that all, that was the mistake of Moses. He presumed that, oh, the father that killed the Egyptian and has saved the Israelites, now two Israelites are fighting, so they are going to accept me. No, 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 they have a track record of your killing. They know you, they figured you out. Even though your heart, your intentions were good, the action was wrong and the people will use your actions against you. Because human beings, we are easy to focus on actions than intentions. But God looks at the heart. And men look at actions. And so even the prophet with all his prophetic anointing went to the house of Jesse, saw Eliab, looked at the physical structure and said, yeah, you are qualified to be king Look, based off on everything I'm looking at. And God said, Samuel, stop it. Stop it, stop it. Stop it. Don't look at the outer appearances. Look into the heart. Are you hearing me? Sometimes when you go to hospital and there are things wrong with you, doctors can take you through all their machines and sometimes they can see the heart, but they cannot know the intent of the heart. And so doctors can diagnose and bring your heart and see your heart pumping, but they don't know what is in the heart. There's only one man on earth who knows what is in the heart, and that is God alone. And so he says that I don't look at the outer appearance, but I look at what is in the heart. Ah, God is judging us based off on the heart. And so don't easily presume that everybody is going to accept you because God prepared you and God gave you a message and said, go. Sometimes the people you are going to save are the people who will crucify you. And this is what they said to Moses, who made you a judge over us? God has made me a judge. Didn't you realize it? No. We didn't hear that. In fact, we were here when they brought you in some basket. You are one of us. But all of a sudden, because you were raised in the palace, you think you are better than us. And people begin to look at you from that angle. And yet they are dealing with their savior, but they don't know. We were here when you came, we saw you running about naked. 
You were brought in some baskets. We saw you. You were one of us, but because you had opportunity to be raised in the palace, you think you are better than, us, better than us. Moses has not said that. And so right away from human point of view, there's re- what? Resentment. And they have already concluded, even before the boy came up. But the boy has a message for the same people. Sometimes the people you are saving are the people who rise up against you. Destiny. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to support you. Life is not designed to support you. Life is designed to frustrate you. It is your desire to push through. It is your willingness to push through that will determine how far you want to be. And so stop telling me I quit. I give up because one thing did not favor you. Many will not favor you. But when the righteous man falls seven times, he will learn how to rise up again because what is in the inside of him is given by God. Don't just quit life because somebody did not believe in you. Don't just quit that because maybe the man you slept with as your husband does not believe in you. Don't quit that because the one you call your pastor who's supposed to be praying for you does not believe in you. Many people are not going to understand you because they didn't hear what you heard. When God told you they were not there and when you come to tell them it doesn't make sense. Many of us, we want approval and acceptance from men, but it doesn't work like that. The day everybody will stand with you and clap their hands and support you and be there for you, remember, you're on the wrong track. There's an old saying I heard when I was growing, growing up. They said the voice of the people is the voice of God. It's a lie. It's not in the Bible. How can the voice of the people be the voice of God? No. Many a time, the voice of the people is contrary to the voice of God. Because human beings want to do what is easy and okay for us, but God would want us to do what is not common, extraordinary. Are you hearing me? And so, stop all these presumptions. I assume that it's going to be okay. I assume that they are going to love me. I think they are going to accept me. No, 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 no. Remember, wherever you are going, everybody wants to go there. So what makes you think that they are going to forget about themselves and come and support you? Whatever you want in life, somebody also wants it. This is one of the things that makes many of us get frustrated in life because we assume that everybody is going to clap their hands for us. I have been there before. And that is why it hurt most because you expect that everybody will, should appreciate you or clap. No, 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 no. Sometimes you will have to have the mindset that it's going to be tough. And when you know that it's going to be tough, it prepares you to face the toughness ahead of you. And sometimes God will just leave you alone. You want to deal with it? You deal with it. You want to walk away? You walk away. It's your choice. And that's why many have died without fulfilling their destiny because they walked away when it became very painful. That's why many died without fulfilling their future because they gave up because somebody did not give them the encouragement they wanted. But you must understand. This is what happened to Moses. You must understand that many will not understand you. Am I blessing somebody here? Number four, the people's unpreparedness. They didn't understand. The reason why they will not support it because they don't understand. When people are not prepared for you, they will frustrate your efforts. But how can you blame them because they don't understand? That's the point. Why do you go through life angry with everybody who opposed you? Do you know what their problem is? They don't understand. How can you blame somebody who doesn't understand? <laughs> and you are angry with somebody because they're opposing you. They're opposing because they don't what? Understand. And so you end up, the most at times what happens. We end up, we forget about the main thing that God told you and we begin to fight the people who don't understand. Because we want them to do what? So you realize that energy is channeled. Am I making sense to somebody here? And so you try making them understand, making them understand. By the time they understand, the vision is gone. Because you want to be man pleaser. Oh, can't you see it this way? Can't you see that way? No. At the fullness of time, it will not lie, it will speak. That's what the Bible says. When at the fullness of time, the vision will do what? 
It will speak when you have not spoken. It is the vision that will speak. It is the manifestation of what God said that will make people know that we were wrong, you were right because the vision itself will speak. And so you don't go through life trying to make everybody understand you. You go through life pursuing the vision and when the vision comes to a place of maturity, the vision will then explain everything you have been through in life. And so you work out the vision. Work out the destiny. That is your work to do. The people are not prepared to receive Moses because they didn't hear God. Moses heard God. God told you something in the beginning and he told you the awesome end but he didn't tell you the in-between. And so in fulfilling your destiny, you have to figure out the in-between. And the in-between will bring frustration even though you are convinced that what you are doing is of God. There are many people who get convinced about what they are doing and God told them how glorious the end will be. But God did not tell them the in-between. And that is where you have to understand and when life wants to be hard, life can use anything. Last Saturday, when we were giving that prayer point, I said that there was Pilate, there was a Pharisee, and there was the and the, and, and there was a high priest. Okay, there was a Pilate, a man in power. There was the high priest who knew the Bible. And you will expect that these people knew the Bible so they should understand that this is the Messiah. But they say no. And there were the Pharisees who have read the Bible. The most righteous people. But they didn't understand. And then in the tomb there had to be a stone. There had to be a seal. And there had to be soldiers. There are things the devil can bring your way to frustrate you. At the point Jesus said, Eli, Eli, where are thou? You better come around. Have you been there before? <laughs> When you are calling God because you felt abandoned. Because he told you something and at the point where you expected him to show up, it's like, no, 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 no. This time you're on your own. I am, my work is done. I told you the beginning. I told you the end. You figure out the in-between. And that's how God is dealing with that. It doesn't mean that he has abandoned us. He's just watching us. Are you hearing me? And so just because people abandon you doesn't mean that you must abandon what is in your heart. Just because people oppose you doesn't mean that you must abandon what is in your heart. Go home with this. Just because people are not applauding you doesn't mean that you must abandon what is in your heart. What is in your heart is your destiny. What is in your heart is what God told you. What is in your heart is what has been wired within you by God. Men will not see it. Men will not feel it. Men will not understand it. And so when men rise up against you, what makes you true is when you hold on to what is in your heart. Because at the end of the day, what makes you great is what is registered in your heart. Amen. God help us. Many of us, young women, women, we have to go back to our teenage time. The things that God told us. And we got married to one man who frustrated us until and now we are so filled with bitterness and anger and animosity towards everybody. Even, when, even to people who have done nothing to us. Because what is in our heart has been abandoned. And see, excuse me, see how strategic the enemy can be. He will do everything to frustrate you and take away what is in your heart or abandon what is in your heart and frustrate you with every other thing. And then finally, he will come back and accuse you. What did you do? With what God told you in your heart. Yet, meanwhile, he's the same person who will bring many other things. That's why I always tell you, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Young woman, fulfill your destiny. Amen. Young man, fulfill your destiny. Amen. I said, fulfill your destiny. Amen. I'm about to close. Let me give you four things that are important to me. Number one, protect your uniqueness. Protect your uniqueness. Protect what is inside of you. Protect it. Protect what is in you. Protect your wire, the way God has wired you. 
Don't try to be somebody else. Be you. You can learn from Oprah, but you are not Oprah. You can learn from Pastor Prince, but you can never be me. So protect who you are. And sometimes who you are can be annoying to other people. Have you been there before? When you yourself, you meet somebody and you just don't like the person, not because they have done anything to you. That's how, that's who you are protected. You don't go about demonstrating who you are to everybody because not everybody can handle who you are. Stop exposing yourself to everybody, trying to tell everybody who you are, what is in your heart, so that you will get validation from people. No, 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 no. Your validation is from God. He's the author and the finisher of your life. He put that thing inside there. He's watching to see the fulfillment of that thing. Can I have an amen? amen? And so protect your uniqueness, number two. Prepare for your assignment. But he keeps striving on. It doesn't make sense, but keep striving on. The education is hard, keep striving on. Building the church is hard, but keep striving on. Doing the ministry is hard, but keep striving on. Keep preparing yourself because there's a time of preparation and there's a time of manifestation. Don't give up your preparation that time. Don't substitute your preparation time. There are many people who get carried away because one prophecy they gave came to pass. And so they think now they have become pastors. And so they run away from their preparation time because they have seen just one little manifestation in their life. No, 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 no. The fact that you wrote that first exams and they, they told you you have passed your medical exam doesn't necessarily mean that you have become a doctor. And so when you go home and you show your result to your father who has never written that exams and they are telling my son you have done well. Wow, you, you passed the medical exam and they are praising you and they start calling you doctor. Tell them, no, 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 I just passed the entry exams. And so make full use of your preparation time because who you become in the future depends on your preparation. And let me sound this question. Sometimes preparation time doesn't favor you. Preparation time, number one, preparing for something is not good. It's hard. On top of it, things go bad. The devil, if there's anything the devil is afraid of, it's your preparation. He will come hard against you. Hard. So hard. And number three, pursue what God has put in your heart. Pursue it. Brother, hear me. If God put it in your heart, pursue it. Sister, if God puts it, puts it in your heart, do what? Pursue it. Because what is in your heart is not given by men. In case you have abandoned something God told you 10 years ago, go back, take it, and pursue it. Stop giving excuses and stop telling people that it is this my husband who married me and, and, and made my life like this. Yes, he married you, but your destiny was not created by you. Stop telling people that it is my father who didn't take good care of me. That is why I have become what I have become. He made a mistake. That doesn't mean that you should also make a mistake. Go back and take it and pursue it. Yeah. I came to encourage somebody here. In KPM, we challenge our people for fulfillment. You are here to fulfill your destiny. It is easy to shift blames around and blame people so that we can get away. And so when you go to heaven, God is not going to ask you how many people frustrated you. God is going to ask you what you did, what he told you in your heart. It came to his heart. Pursue it. It's going to be hard. Pursue it. It's going to be frustrating. Pursue it. You might not get support. Pursue it. It's be hard. People will oppose you. Pursue it. Systems will oppose you. Pursue it. The devil will stand against you. Pursue it. Trusted friends will turn their back for you. Pursue it. Sister, sometimes your own strength will fade, but you need to stand firm. Oh, if life is that easy, People, all of us will be millionaires. Right? And so you hit it, you fall, you rise up again. Sometimes it's good to talk about it. I'm going to be great. Talk it, talk it. It's okay. But after the talking, pursue it. Work hard, strive. And after pursuing, patiently wait for the right moment to act. One of the mistakes of Moses was that he acted at the wrong time. Sometimes when you act at the wrong time, it doesn't take what God said in your heart away. It just brings more trouble. <laughs> because what God has said, the Bible says he has exalted his word above his name. 
So what God said is definitely powerful. He's going to watch over it. But when we act at the wrong time, we bring more trouble. May God give us patience to act at the right time. And I believe Moses was hasty. And that cost him 40 years in the wilderness. And that also cost his, the people around him to spend extra 30 years. And so sometimes if you are hasty, it does not just cost you, but it also costs the people around you. So your that life is not just about you. Your life is all about the people around you. And so when you are making decisions, you are doing things, consider the people around you. Am I blessing somebody here? If you don't keep what you have diligently in your heart, you set your life back and the people around you. There's a place for you to fit in as I close. There's a place for you in life. Some are doctors. Some are lawyers. Some are millionaires. But you also fit somewhere. And so take your eyes off from all the big guys, the doctors and the lawyers and the president and focus on where you fit in. This is what happened to us most of the time. We tend to talk about all the people that have made a big time and we tend to celebrate them and then we ask, we behave as if we don't fit anywhere. We fit somewhere. Even if you are weird, there's a weird place for you to fit in. There's a weird place for you where the daughter can never fit in. When you get there, you will fit in, and you will fit in and you become weird with them. And the weird people will also have a company. <laughs> Are you with me? Even if you are unusual, there's an unusual place for you to fit in. Why do you behave as if you don't fit anywhere? You fit somewhere. Can you imagine if all of us are doctors? Can you imagine if all of us are preaching to intellectuals? There was a time in Ghana, some prophetic anointing broke out, and people were just, men of God were just being raised powerfully. So anyhow, anyhow. And you will hear one man of God has come out as a prophet. His prophets are powerful. And sometimes, I'm sorry, but some of them are not educated. And so, when they speak, they speak very raw. They say things very strange. And then, the pastors that were educated, the, the fathers of the last started, started lambasting these guys. You no, know, hitting hard at them, thinking that they are doing wrong things. And my point was that all of us cannot be like you. Not every pastor must be educated. There are some pastors who are called the educated and they will meet the intellectuals. There are pastors who are not educated and so there are people who are not educated and so their pastors must be ready to meet them. Maybe what the senior pastor needed to do was to gather all these junior ones who are not educated and at least teach them the basic principles of life so that all together we can fit in because this one that we're being lambasted at, they need, they need, they fitted somewhere. We fit somewhere. You fit somewhere. Your sister fits somewhere. So regardless of who you are, don't look down upon yourself because you don't have a degree. You fit somewhere. Don't look down upon yourself because you don't have that physical beauty. You fit somewhere. Even if you think you are ugly, there's an ugly place for you to fit in. Amen. You can choose not to say amen. You fit somewhere. You are unique. Trust me. Let all of them become doctors. And let all of us become doctors. And let's see. Have you met, been in the place where all the people are nurses? Have you seen how they behave? Everybody is powerful. I've, I've been there. I've, I've met 10 group of women. All of them are nurses. You, you can't talk anybody out of anything. Confusion and commotion. Because everybody believes that they are what? Great. And so let somebody work in with LPN. And then you realize that, oh, they want to boss over you or they want to rule over you. But by so doing, it makes life peaceful. And so God is so smart that he has created you to fit somewhere. And when we go to heaven, God is going to judge us based on how well we fitted in that place. And not how big you became in life. There are prophets in the old days. We call them minor prophets and we call some of them major prophets. I don't know where the differentiation came from. They call them minor because they wrote small books. And we call the ones who wrote big books major. But as a matter of fact, they were all what? Prophets. 
there were prophets that have to be there only for three years. If God had not used them within that three years, the people would have gone astray. So you fit somewhere. Don't let that your husband talk you down. Don't let that sister of yours talk you down. Believe in yourself. It's just that caution. You must also go through life appreciating everybody around you for who they are. But it doesn't mean that you must abandon yourself and try to be like everybody else. You cannot. In fulfilling your destiny, you must know what is said in your heart. What is in your heart is the number one thing, the key factor. Hold on to what is in your heart. When everything fails, what is said in your heart will still stand because that is what is written in the volume of the book concerning your destiny. As I close, I pray that God will give you grace to hold on to what God said in your heart. In case you have abandoned it, go back for it. Run with it. And that is what will make you fulfill your destiny. In Jesus' name. Amen.